Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, this is about my 12th trip to Australia, about my third time coming to Adelaide, and it's always a delight. It's been 45 years since I finished my undergrad degree. I don't know where the years went. They were all fun, and it's just a surprise to me that it can be that long ago. Uh, but one of the things that's made that go by so fast is that I've been one of those fortunate people who has worked at something I loved all the time. And when you work at something you love, it's almost not like work, right? Because you just enjoy doing it. Part of the joy of that is working with the men and women who do engineering and science. And so when you think about it, when you come to a conference, you originally sign up because of the theme, because of the speakers. But the most valuable thing at a conference are your fellow attendees the people you interact with, the people you learn from, the people you network with, and that you will collaborate with for the rest of your lives. So always remember that and always be grateful that you can attend a conference. We had a, year, a few years back in the uh, US where because of the budget crises and a few other things, we weren't letting people go to conferences. I couldn't believe it, you know, because in engineering, going to a conference is part of the scientific and engineering method. You have to go, you have to present your ideas, you have to take the criticisms and ideas and additives, additives that come. And so if you don't go to a conference as a scientist or engineer, it's almost like being a pilot and not ever flying, you know? And of course, we wouldn't overdo that. <laughs> so let me talk about something that's exciting to me right now. I think we're at a, one of those unique junctures in science and engineering where we were at a real inflection point. And the advent, the advance, the strong push on including more autonomy in our systems is gonna change almost everything. And like always, there's some good and there's some bad about that. Sometimes when science advances really fast, when science and engineering advance really fast, our policymakers, our legal systems, are not really ready for it. And I think there's a little bit of that going on in autonomy right now. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the important role of system engineering in this advance of autonomy. And we'll talk about some of the challenges that we'll see. So first off, why do we even care about autonomy? Well, the classic reasons that you'll often hear about is well, we care about autonomy because of speed, because of the volume of things you have to deal with, because of the danger of certain situations, because of persistence. You know, people, we get bored. I bet there's people in this audience right now looking at their phones instead of me. <laughs> because we do this, don't we? <laughs> and yet there's sometimes when you need something constantly watching. And uh, one of the classics in that is uh, space surveillance, where you know, for over 50 years now, we've had things in space watching the Earth, watching for various stuff. Another one is the whole idea of communications and communications breakdown. Because sometimes you cannot communicate with the device, just like sometimes you can't communicate with people. And so I think there are a lot of analogies for us to use uh, when we think about machines that are more autonomous to how we think about when people that we start granting more autonomy to. So we'll, we'll see that, this is the teaser here. So our systems already are increasingly autonomous. Look at some of these facts, these are all from uh, Gartner. Algorithmic driven agents work in 5% of economic transactions. 20% of all business content authored by machines. Six billion connected things requesting support by 2020. And I've heard other things on the internet of uh, things that maybe 20 billion devices by 2020, maybe 50 billion. It seems like every time you hear about the internet of things, the number goes up. 50% of the fastest growing companies will have fewer employees than smart machines. And then my favorite fact, more than three million workers globally will be supervised by robo bosses. I've had some of those guys already. Have you had some of those guys already? So maybe this isn't an advance. Maybe this is just a continuation of a trend. Autonomy is also becoming really big business, a growing market for smart machines. Some of these machines, we're not, we don't even know what's going on under the hood. And so there's a debate that goes on in this business of whether something is truly autonomous or whether it's just automated. Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. And 
in some big studies that we did in the Defense Science Board, I chaired a study in 2015 on autonomy for the Department of Defense. We started to debate that and said, you know, we're not gonna go anywhere if we get too involved with the philosophical debate of whether something's automated or autonomous. Let's just recognize the fact that there's more autonomous functionality coming in to all sorts of things. So look at the business numbers here, 15 billion by 2019, and we'll probably, we're probably underestimating that. Uh, here's one that's a little different, but instead of the whole number of devices that are gonna be connected to the net, look at this, 2021, a million Internet of Things devices will be purchased and installed per hour. Per hour, how can that be? Amazon is gonna be really rich, but then they already are, it seems like. <laughs> now, some autonomous systems are not systems that move. Many times when we talk about autonomy, we think about self-driving cars and uh, self-flying airplanes or undersea devices and stuff. And so in our study, we started talking about autonomy at motion and autonomy at rest. And there's a lot of autonomy going on at rest in devices that think, plan, strategize for us. Uh, when, you, when you put your, your uh, debit card into that ATM machine. It used to be it gave you money. Now it gives you money, but it's also assessing you. Is this, you know, is looking at your patterns, where you are, how often you get money, and it's sifting data about you for marketing value every time you use your debit card, every time you use your credit card, every time you go on an airline with your frequent flyer card, they're getting marketing information on you, and they're using AI systems to get value out of that. Others are really things that move, such as robots, unmanned air vehicles. Um, some of these are more autonomous than others. When we think of drones, sometimes we think of drones uh, in the early days where they were flown by joystick pilots. But most of these systems, even if there's an override by a pilot now, most of them are doing a lot of their functions, a lot of their missions, autonomously, on board, making decisions. I know in, um, let's see, in, uh, in 2000, I think it was 2001, uh, the Global Hawk system uh, flew from, from uh, Edwards Air Force Base to Australia, and nobody guided it the whole time. Now, beforehand, they sort of put in the coordinates of where it was supposed to go at various times, what altitude it was supposed to fly at, but then responding to its environment and everything else, it flew from takeoff at Edwards across the Pacific and landed in Australia on its own. Someday, we'll, we'll have planes like that. I'm a believer in technology, but I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> I like having a pilot in the front, maybe even two, right, when you go on these long flights. But as was mentioned by uh, the man talking about the, uh, the bullet trains, Lots of times now that pilot is an extra safety factor, not the main thing flying the plane or, flying, or running the train. And so it's actually adding to the safety that we have two diverse systems controlling it. And we often talk about diversity in all kinds of manners. There's a place where diversity helps, having two systems that aren't completely tied to each other that are providing some extra safety and insurance. These smart machines, I've already mentioned, you know, the ATM, it's more than just an automated system because it's doing a lot behind the hood. And uh, we're starting to see automated cleaning systems. Uh, of course, we've always had autopilots and such. The head of the Defense Science Board is an interesting man named Craig Fields, and he lives in uh, the D.C. area. And while we were doing the autonomy study, uh, he was walking around one of the suburbs, and there were two machines like that little machine at the bottom, except they were delivery machines traveling and uh, making deliveries. And there were two people walking behind him, and so he thought they were controlling him, and he asked about that, and he said, oh no, we're just taking data. They actually make all the deliveries by themselves. It's kind of like the postman now. Uh, and so what is that gonna do to all the jobs that postmen fill right now? We have some reality, virtual reality devices. I think uh, the, in Japan, they've been working really hard on devices to help connect senior citizens, people that have disabilities, to connect them more realistically with their friends, with their families, with their uh, people that need to, to provide help to them. And these are advancing very quickly right now. This is actually, a, I think, a, yeah, this is a, a picture in uh, Carnegie Mellon 
with a, a telepresence robot that they have there. But autonomous systems, why is this happening now? I worked um, in the Air Force for 32 years, as was mentioned earlier, and in the early 1990s, we were working hard on AI and some robotics. But you know, it didn't really happen then. It didn't really happen then. At that point, a lot of our systems were, were, were what were called knowledge-based systems. We were trying to define all the rules, and if you could just define all the rules, that uh, all the situations that a device might find itself in, we thought we could give it some autonomy. And you know, that, that, system, that did work to some extent, but it ran into a little bit of a dead end. Because people, that's not how we do things. We don't know all the rules. We take in data from the time we're born, probably nowadays I think they have evidence even while we're in the womb. We're taking in data that's teaching us about the world and teaching us how to make decisions. And so now, one of the big things has been this whole area of deep learning, which is a little bit of a, like the neural nets of the 1990s. And deep learning has achieved a lot, but it's got some of its own issues that we'll talk about later, because it can only learn from the data that it's given. And so you have to be really careful what data sets you craft for it. But these things have happened, and these, all these different areas, the uh, digitization and almost uh, uh, the, the cheapness and ubiquitous, ubiquity of sensors. You know, our phones have cameras and accelerometers and all sorts of things, and it's so cheap now. So the cheapness of sensors, the fact that sensors can be everywhere, the advances that have been made in algorithms, the tremendous advances on the AI side, on natural user interfaces, machine learning, and machine vision, these things are all coming together at almost the same time, along with tremendous advances in computational power and architectures for computational power. So things that we couldn't do in the 1990s, we're now able to do. It's also, I mean, I work in the software business now, although I'm a, I'm a physicist. You know, one thing I always thought was funny is uh, I was an Air Force person, but I wasn't a pilot. I'm at Carnegie Mellon, but I'm not a faculty member. And I'm at the Software Engineering Institute, but I'm not a software engineer. We, we are all unique people, aren't we? And we have our own paths on how we get to where we are. And that's one of the strengths of uh, the system, is that we come with different backgrounds. But software itself has made some tremendous advances that are kind of supplementing these technical advances that have been made in other fields. We've made tremendous strides in how to think about architectures in the software world. We've gotten to the point where, just like in the physical sciences, we can do some modeling in SIM early, based on physics-based models. In software, we're getting to the point where we can do virtual integration of software modules in a quantitative sense, not just a qualitative sense, and look at latencies, look at various parameters and quality attributes of software before we build it. Because we all know when we build things, being human, we put in some defects, and the defects get harder and more expensive to, to fix the later in the program cycle we are. This movement that's come a little bit of an outgrowth of the Agile movement, but, the, uh, but, but also an extension of that into this idea of DevOps has really changed the software world. And this has been largely perfected in the commercial software business, in places like Silicon Valley, in places like uh, uh, Microsoft and Amazon up in, uh, in the, the Seattle area. But this DevOps movement of continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous delivery of software is really changing the software world, and it's very important to the autonomy advances that are being made. It's also that all these things are coming together at one point. This is a picture uh, in 2007 at the DARPA Urban Challenge. They had their first uh, sort of rural challenge uh, a little bit earlier than that, in I think 2005. But in 2007, they did an urban challenge where cars had to operate in a simulated city and they had other cars driving around, some with people, some not. And this is the uh, winning car. Uh, this is a Carnegie Mellon entry, actually, that won uh, a guy named um, uh, Red Whitaker was the leader of the team. And while it's impressive what it could do, that's not the car you or I would drive down the highway today. This is autonomous car 2014. And it looks like a car. 
This looks like a Cadillac, yeah. And you can have, there's similar ones of these by Mercedes and uh, other companies. It, it does have, if you look above the windshield there, it's got a little extra sensor there, a little LiDAR sensor. But this is something you would drive and you wouldn't feel so strange. In Pittsburgh, Uber moved their autonomous car uh, production and test facilities to Pittsburgh a few years ago, hired half of the people in the robotics part of Carnegie Mellon. It was a disaster for Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they were good people. And now we've replaced them. And so Pittsburgh's becoming a hub for autonomy kind of engineers. But in, in Pittsburgh, every day that I drive to work, every day I pass at least one Uber autonomous car being test driven on the roads. Now, like a lot of things right now, those test cars, it's not that they don't have a driver. In fact, they got two drivers in the car. <laughs> in the front seat, they got a guy behind the wheel just in case. And then they got another sort of driver engineer taking data, recording data, making sure they're getting as much value as they can out of this. Um, there's some frustrating things about autonomous cars. They obey the rules. <laughs> they don't roll through stop signs. They don't go over the speed limit. They stop for pedestrians. Some of us <laughs> don't always do this. So when you're behind one of these autonomous cars, as a driver, you have to be a little more alert and really on your game to follow the rules. Now, um, I, I, occasionally I've been fortunate enough to go to something called the Science and Technology and Society in uh, Kyoto, Japan. And uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe was there. Well, he goes every year, but he was, two years ago, he was talking about the Olympics that are coming up in Tokyo in 2020. And he said that by 2020, the taxis in Tokyo were gonna be autonomous, self-driven taxis. He, he's, I think, the only head of a country who's actually ridden in a self-driving car so far, and he's putting a lot of faith in this. Of course, there's competitiveness between countries, right? So the next, the deputy premier of, uh, of uh, Russia got up and said, well, in 2018 in Russia, at the World Cup, we're gonna have self-driving cars. We'll see, we'll see. I think some of this is not gonna come quite as fast as people thought because of legal and policy and societal things, not because of the technology per se. Autonomous systems can improve productivity. That's one reason a lot of companies wanna go for it. You know, they can do things faster, do things more accurate. Sometimes, here's one of those societal things, replace a lot of expensive labor. But what will those people do? If we, have, if we replace all that labor, what are they going to do with their time? But autonomous systems can, replace, uh, can do a lot of productivity improvements. They can operate continuously. And, of course, uh, much of the early days of the space program, the current days of the space program, are done with unmanned vehicles. We do get excited about manned space flights as well. But for me, one of the top system engineering organizations in the world is the Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech. And when you look at some of the missions they've done over the years, you know, and they have to go autonomous because they're so far from Earth, you can't really communicate in any reasonable time with some of these vehicles. It's just amazing what they have done. I, I think they're one of the world's great s system engineering organizations. They also can increase information sharing. They can have so much information, autonomous systems coming into them, sorting through it, analyzing it, fusing it, making it into real knowledge versus just a lot of data. They can pr process tremendous volumes of data, more volume than us humans can do. We're tremendous at seeing patterns, especially visual patterns, but they can take in so much data, sift through it, you know, through data analytics and other methods, find that little bit of information that they were looking for in a whole field full of information that comes through. And one place we're seeing sort of expert systems start to really have an impact is in medicine. Uh, there's no doctor in the world today that can keep up with all the literature. There's so much being published. And although I'm not ready, again, not ready to have a, a machine diagnose me, I think the combination of a doctor with a machine is a really powerful thing. Sometimes people call these centaur systems. In a centaur system where the, the doctor has that interface with the patient 
and it starts to read the patient's mind almost a little bit by whether they're suffering or not and kind of pulling stuff out. And at the same time, having a machine that's sifting through all the newest data to say, well, if they have these three symptoms, maybe you should try this test to see if it's this problem. But if it's not, then here's a second diagnosis that might be right. These are really helping out in medicine right now. They can go where we cannot go safely. Fukushima was one example of where some, some early kind of forms of robotics autonomous devices have gone. A lot of things at the bottom of the ocean have done exploration autonomously. And uh, of course, a lot of things with uh, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and other sort of dangerous situations are being handled more and more by autonomous systems. And we've used them to explore the universe, as you know. And there's uh, the JPL contribution, as well as some other organizations in the world. So now we come to the hard part of this. That's the fun part. Now we come into the hard part. What about system engineering and autonomy? How are we, as system engineers, going to do our job to make sure these systems are built correctly, are apt for their function, you know, um, don't have defects in them that could cause danger, loss of life, whatever. How are we going to do that? And there's some, some typical challenges here. Some of these are not new. We're seeing these already with the more complicated and complex systems we're building, even if they're not autonomous. But some special aspects become more important as we go to true autonomy. So complexity, connectedness, functional allocation, and trust. And boy, already in these two days, I've gone to lots of meetings that have talked about complexity and connectedness. That's a, a hot topic in system engineering anyway, right? So when you look at autonomous systems, here's some things we're starting to notice about them. And as you look through this list, modular architecture, not knowing all the requirements up front, all that, you, you can't help but get a feel that this is a area where more agile development techniques are going to be important. We aren't going to know all the requirements up front. We're not going to be able to deliver a whole system up front. These are systems that are evolving on a time scale of, of months and days, not years. So the system we build, will, what we want to do will change even in the development cycle that we're doing. So it looks to me like the, the strong contributions from the Agile world and from the development ops world are going to be right in the heart of a lot of autonomy design. And of course, we have to have not just Agile software development, but Agile system development. So what are some of the things that complexity causes that's a problem or an opportunity for autonomous systems? Well, really high on the list is that as these systems get smarter and as they get more complex, there's a tremendous possibility of emergent behavior. And emergent behavior can be good. You know, a lot of animals use that to do, accomplish things that they individually would not be able to do. But it also can be bad. It can take things in a way that we didn't forecast, that we have to worry about danger to people. So complexity is at the heart of a lot of the issues with autonomy. Another thing, and I mentioned it a little bit already, was this whole idea of when we build these systems, we're going to probably build them in pieces through agile-like techniques. I don't know if you want to call them sprints or whatever, but it's going to be a more continuous delivery methodology. And so we're going to be delivering new capability often. And when you think about how we, for example, in the United States, build defense systems, we have a very formal methodology of development, test, independent tests, and then deployment. I don't know that it's ready to adapt to a system where maybe every three weeks the system's changing. Or every two weeks there's new capabilities. How will we go through all those steps with the formal DT&E and IOT&E, you know, independent operational test and evaluation? How will we do that on a three week notice? We have a hard time doing that on yearly cycles right now. The system also is going to be continuously changing, not only from the bits that we add to it, the fact that we're adding capability, but a lot of these systems uh, are self-learning systems. 
And so the way it makes decisions, the knowledge base it has to make decisions today will not be the same as two weeks from now. That also has implications for the test community who likes to think we're gonna test something and then when we deploy it, it sort of stays the same because it's not gonna stay the same. The system boundary, the system boundary and human machine interface kind of go together here. The system boundary may be hard to define because the system and the human operator, I mean, everything's interacting with the human at some point. It may change where that boundary is with time and with circumstance and situation. When you have good calm, maybe the human is more in control. When you have reduced calm, maybe not so much. The system has to be able to adapt. Recently, DARPA did another one of their famous challenges, and this was called the Dar uh, DARPA Robotic Challenge. Um, and in this challenge, humanoid-like robots. So these were robots that looked like people, a little bigger than people, like 350 pounds or so, uh, had to get into a car and drive the car. So that's different than a self-driving car, which is all integrated into the car. This was a robot that had to get into a car and drive the car. And then it had to get out. Then it had to do some sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, work type uh, issues. It had to uh, saw a hole in a wall. It had to turn a crank like for a, a, a fire extinguisher, water thing. It had to open a door. It had to climb over some steps and climb up a step and all that. And there were like seven or eight tasks that it had to do. And uh, they were like 27 teams entered. Uh, three teams completed all the tasks, which is really amazing when you think how far this has come over the last few years. The team that won was actually from KAIST, uh, the Korean uh, Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, which really kind of frosted the, the Carnegie Mellon guys and the guys from the University of Florida, who came in second and third. Uh, all three of those teams did all the tasks, but the tiebreaker was how fast you could do the task, and the KAIST team did the team faster. But the interesting thing of this was that this was not an attempt at full autonomy. This was a contest where th there, was, there were human operators and machines working together, but at various times during the contest, the comm throughput, the comm bandwidth was reduced, and the system had to adapt to that. So pretty interesting how that works, and we're making such advances on this. The whole impact of connectedness, you know, now, Everything is getting to be connected to everything. And uh, most of us in this room, we've got our cell phones, we've probably got our iPads, we've, or our surfaces, or other, and it, we, we don't have one connection going on right now, we've got three or four connections going on right now. And that's the way life is. I was talking earlier, you know, it just gets me in the morning when you're, on a, when you're a traveler and you go to the restaurant, and you're the, you know, the business traveler, so you're there by yourself. So you got an excuse for looking at your cell phone while you eat dinner or breakfast because that's a way to not look lonely, right? It looks like I'm doing something important. <laughs> Maybe you're doing nothing, but it makes you not feel so lonely. But the thing that's so strange is that you'll see couples in there and they're on their cell phones. It's like people don't really talk anymore. You know, they're, you could have eight people at a table and there'd be eight cell phone guys. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like prayer, right? It's sort of like grace, you know, you're looking at your phone. So we're all connected to everything, but this, these connections are ad hoc. They, they come on, they come off. New kind of devices come in. And so the boundary, the range of all this multi-connected system, hyper-connected system is always changing. It's never quite the same. And new interfaces are coming in all the time because of you know, what engineers do. Engineers innovate. And the innovation keeps adding devices to be connected to this macro system that's around the world. Now, we love this connection, but this connection opens up even more vulnerabilities. Because when you're connected, a weakness almost anywhere can be a weakness to everyone. And unfortunately, the world has started to see that, right? We've had these sort of cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, all kinds of attacks that have really started to affect People and you know, so much, occasionally these have taken down hospitals for a time or the power systems at hospitals. What a horrible thing! What a horrible thing! It's one thing to not get your email for a little while, it's another thing when it starts to impact a hospital or a self driving car or a fleet of self driving cars on the highway, kind of in a convoy. What happens when we have a, a hundred car collision because somebody hacked the connectivity of those cars? 
Now, with connectiveness, all of us as engineers know that coupling matters, and some things are loosely coupled and some things are tightly coupled. Um, we want things that move fast to be relatively tightly coupled, right? <laughs> we don't want them to kind of lose sync in, in things, but we also know that you can't have everything tightly coupled. So this is something that has to be in our design methodologies and our design thought early in all the systems we do. And then finally, of course, we have this whole idea of information overload. These systems can take in all the information we can throw at them, but we as people can't do that. And ultimately, ultimately, this information has to get into people's minds somehow. It may be distilled to a single nugget, but ultimately it has to get into people's minds. You know, in my early Air Force career, I worked in the space program. And there was a, just like there is in everything in life, there's a pecking order, you know. In the Air Force, for example, pilots are above all the rest of us, and fighter pilots are above pilots, okay. Um, in the space program, in those days, you know, the satellite, people who worked on the satellite were above the ground station. I don't know that that's true anymore. The ground station does so many important things. And on the satellite, the people who were working on the payload were above the people who were working on the bus, the support kind of functions. So this hierarchy of, of kind of things is really changing now. And now we're seeing where the people who actually control the information, the information flow, the data, are the people rising to the top. After I left the space world where you know, the, the key guys were the payload builders for the satellite, I went to the command and control world and that's when I kind of had one of those aha moments when I go, well, none of this matters if it doesn't really get to people. <laughs> At some point, it's got to get into people's minds. Here's something kind of new, functional allocation. So when we build these systems, and one thing system engineers do is kind of do functional allocation, right? When we build these systems, we have to understand that what is going to be done by the computer or the system and what's going to be done by humans may change with time. Algorithms are advancing fast. Some things that maybe initially we are not ready to let a computer do, a little while later we may let a computer do, okay? The other thing that was really interesting was this whole idea of dynamic allocation. It's not just that there's a one-time decision on how these allocations would go and that they will evolve with time. It's also that the allocation may change on a very short schedule based on the environmental situations. Um, if you're a self-driving car and you're in communication with all the other cars on the highway, uh, right now, for example, and all of a sudden you're in deep fog, most of the self-driving cars can't handle deep fog right now. And so at some point you're gonna have to return that to the driver. How do we keep the driver involved with situational awareness when they have come to be comfortable and depend upon the self-driving nature of the car? We've, had, we've faced this problem in airplanes already with autopilots and other things because we've gotten so used to the autopilots that for long periods of time, sometimes the pilot's attention is diverted. And if all of a sudden an emergency happens, does that pilot have the situational awareness to take over? And we know, we all know of some accidents that have happened because they didn't have the situational awareness. We're gonna see that here too, where how are we gonna keep humans involved so that they can take over when most of the time they're not in the loop, they're just on the loop. One of the things that we think is gonna be important here is this whole idea of sort of a hypervisor, something in the background watching everything that kind of leads to safe modes if a system starts to get in trouble, and also to this whole idea of what uh, in the military we often call commander's intent. And let me explain that a little bit. If we have a bunch of soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, whatever, and they go out on a mission, they usually have a mission and they have, they're told what they're gonna do, okay? And sometimes they either finish their mission or they can't do that mission, but now they're out on patrol. They don't just sit there and wait for another order, right? They know what the commander's intent was, and they know how to be useful even after that, what to do even when things don't go the way they expect. So one question is, how are we gonna possibly put something like commander's intent, something like a higher order 
uh, instruction set onto systems that are autonomous so that when, when things go wrong, when things get accomplished, when the environment changes, they can still do something useful. And this all gets to the number one issue with autonomous systems, and that's trust. This is a lot like people, right? Trust is a big issue among people. Some of the components of trust that we've started to look at are along this wield. These are things that can help us in developing trust with systems. Familiarity, building in quality, uh, evolution, so we get used to things as we give more autonomy to a system. Um, strong vulnerability discovery and defect discovery. Uh, ways to make teams work together and then validation and verification techniques. Familiarity. I'm old enough to remember that guy in the upper left. I, was, I remember when they had, had operators and elevators. And I remember when they started to take them out. And of course, I was a kid then, but I remember my grandmother, well, what if it keeps going up? Even worse, what if it keeps going down? I mean, people were worried about these things. But now nobody even thinks about this, right? Now, they're not fully autonomous, I understand that, but there's an element of autonomy. In their day, they seemed like magic almost, right? And now, we don't worry about elevators, right? We get them on all the time. Uh, One-dimensional trains, you know, especially at airports and stuff, pretty much now don't have any drivers in them, and we're okay with that. Uh, I was told once that when they built the Washington Metro in 76, it was gonna be autonomous, no drivers, but people felt too uncomfortable with that. So they've had drivers in there all the time. Most, lots of times they have saved some issues when, that have happened, but occasionally when an issue has come up where they were supposed to intervene, they've been asleep because the system pretty much drives itself and how do you keep somebody involved? So as we go to two-dimensional systems and three-dimensional systems like airplanes, we will start to become more familiar, but we're not quite there yet. The whole idea that uh, so software engineers and system engineers work on about building quality in, testing quality in, getting quality designed in from the very beginning of the system is really important. And uh, yeah, and we know, uh, and I've seen some things at this conference too, that defects are often introduced early, especially requirements defects, but when they're taken out late, they're very expensive to fix. So we have to continue to develop more modern tools. And the DevOps community has done a lot on this with continuous testing. Every night, testing changes to systems and throwing random tests at systems just to see how they react. Now, with autonomous testing, we can test systems a lot more fully than we ever did before. We have to plan for the maintenance and evolution of these systems. There was a time in the software world, especially when I was young in the Air Force, where we thought software, gosh, what a perfect medium. It doesn't change. Once we deliver it, we won't have to do anything with it. It doesn't wear out. And yet we found the maintenance of software has been a big load for almost all organizations. The continued upgrade, the continuous patching. So really, software intensive systems are never done. We're gonna to have to architect for that, for the fact that these systems will continue to grow and evolve with time. The cybersecurity of these systems. So on the one hand, when we did the Defense Science Board study, we said, gosh, you know, one thing that could really help cybersecurity is to do autonomous testing of devices. We can have robotic red teams attacking systems all the time. And people do that now, and it works pretty well. But those systems themselves are software systems and they're prone to being hacked and broken and compromised. So we have to be worried about that. And when we have autonomous systems, we actually introduce some new cyber vulnerabilities, especially in the training sets. Because if you mistrain a system, that's a deep learning system, and it could be a subtle mistraining, you may not know how it's gonna act in all situations. There's one, uh, I think it's an apocryphal example, but someplace when they were building some of these autonomous systems early on, they were training a system to tell between dogs and cats, dogs and cats, dogs and cats, dogs and cats. Every picture that they had of a dog was during the daytime. They finally showed a dog at nighttime and I thought it was a cat. <laughs> so you have to train systems, you have to really craft these, the training sets to cover the span, to, you know, to really span the possibilities you have, otherwise they're gonna sub-optimize. Um, I think we already mentioned the fact that the classic U.S. Department of Defense 
path of development has development, then DT&E, then OT&E, then deployment. We think that for these systems, that's not going to work. And so one of the challenges for system engineers, software engineers, program managers, et cetera, is to develop new verification and validation strategies that will adequately address these systems. Now, lots of places already do some blend of development and operational tests. That's definitely a good idea. Some places are starting to look at formal methods. Formal methods for many years kind of had a bad name because they didn't scale to any kind of system of usable size. But actually now they're starting to. And uh, there was a DARPA program that finished about a year ago called Hackums that did a formal proof of a core system that couldn't be penetrated by hackers, and it never was. And so you go, hmm, now that was a specialized system. Can we start to do things like that, at least for the core of an autonomous system? I believe, I'm a physical scientist, I believe in modeling in SIM. I've had heated arguments, I mean really heated arguments with the head of operational tests for the Department of Defense, Mike Gilmore, he's passed on now to, uh, you know, get the change of administrations. Passed on, maybe that's a bad use of a word. <laughs> he's still around, but he's not in the Department of Defense now. And, you know, some people believe that you can't depend on modeling and sim because it only incorporates the physics we know and not the things we don't know. And it, it has a bias in it because lots of times with modeling and sim, you're sort of it's, it's often the designers who build that, so they're going to test the things they know they've taken care of, right? Uh, and so that's why they like to do physical testing. But the truth of the matter is, on almost all the systems we build today, they have too many states to ever be fully tested. And the only way we're going to get better validation coverage, verification coverage, is to use a lot of modeling in SIM, and then point-wise test at various places along the boundaries and stuff to make sure that the modeling in SIM is good. So I think we're going to have to do that. And one special approach is uh, Lincoln Lab has developed this uh, concept they call the sidecar approach for over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, where it's, they get taps of data from operational systems. It's the same data going to the real world system. It comes off into a sidecar system where they can do more experiments and do more data analysis to see how the system's operating, how it's making decisions. That may be something good. And then the last thing I think starts to get at this whole problem with continuous learning and the fact that systems will change and change and change. And that's to follow the playbook from Silicon Valley. Now they do it for a different reason. They want to be first to market, so they build something quick and then they throw it out there and then we are the beta testers, right? We all test their software, give them reports, and then they fix them. Well, we may have to do that with these systems that continuously change, that continue to evolve, either because they are learning themselves or because we're adding capabilities. But I don't think most of us have an infrastructure for systems that will collect all this data, analyze it, and then continue to put out patches, upgrades, et cetera, for systems. So I think we're going to have to be, in the governmental sense, in the automobile sense and such, have infrastructure built to collect this data and look at these systems. Human machine teaming. So this is where we get to some analogies. In the real world, the world you and I live in, um, autonomy is granted usually slowly and within some context. We all have, most of us here probably have children, maybe some don't. And you know, with children, we start to give them more autonomy. We get proud, we give them more autonomy, and then they become teenagers and we want to take it back. <laughs> but, but in reality, we, we build confidence in people, we observe them, and then based on their actions, we give people more and more autonomy. Probably a good analogy for how we're going to work with these machines. In addition, for those of us who served in the military, so soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen, whatever, we take them into the military, we sort of tear them down through basic training <laughs> and then start to build them back up. And the good thing here, the point I want to make here is, is that not only do we start to grant more autonomy to the individuals, but because the individuals almost always accomplish their missions in teams, we also test and exercise and train them in teams. So they build trust among each other, and we build trust in them as a team. This is going to be something important for machines that are autonomous, especially in those early days when they're more centaur systems, when they are working with humans. 
around humans, helping humans. We're gonna have to figure out how to build trust there. Now, Asimov had his three laws, almost most people know his three laws, you know, and maybe that's something that we need too to build trust. And that gets at the point that I said earlier about a hypervisor, some kind of core program operating above the regular mission that's making sure the system doesn't go out of boundaries that we think are hard boundaries that we don't want the machine to go out of. Now, I don't quite know how we're going to put the ethics in there yet that Asimov did with his three laws, but something on the order of commander's intent or mission orders or some hard boundaries may be very important. We talked about trust, and we do want the humans to trust the systems, but we also have to worry about the systems trusting themselves, the systems trusting other systems, and the systems knowing when they should trust humans or when not. And that's an interesting concept, right? But there's sometimes when maybe the system shouldn't trust a human. What if there's a human trying to break into the system and give it some orders or training that it shouldn't do? Okay, we have examples of this at a rudimentary level already. In some airplanes, I think Airbus, they have three computers, I think is right, does that sound right? Kind of checking each other and also checking the pilot. And sometimes if the pilot wants to do something, the computers may say, oh, that doesn't make sense. We don't want to do that right now, you know? Um, so we, we have to find ways to build this trust among there and also to start to identify when you shouldn't trust. Is there a point, is there a way to help the computer know that it shouldn't trust itself anymore? For, again, people about my age, there was this movie a long time ago in the, maybe it was the early 70s, late 60s, 2001. And the famous computer on there, HAL. You know, at some point, uh, Dave, one of the astronauts, asked it to do something, and HAL says, I can't do that, Dave. Ooh, because HAL's going a little bad, you know? And we, we want to know when we can trust systems, and we want the systems to know when they can trust themselves. Now, why is this important? We're engineers. We're all, we're all in on this, right? We all want to make these systems work. Why is it so important? Well, there's some people starting to raise some real alarms. Here's uh, Steve Wozniak, you know, one of the founders of Apple. Computers are going to take over from humans, no question. If we build these devices to take care of everything for us, Eventually, they'll think faster than us, and they'll get rid of the slow humans. Ooh. Elon Musk. I hope we're not just the biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. Unfortunately, that is increasingly probable. Stephen Hawking. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell, spell the end of the human race. I mean, he's somebody you have to pay attention to, right? <laughs> Stephen Hawking. But some say it's actually going to help and it maybe enhance or extend. Some of these guys are a little kooky at times, but you know, it's like one person here is Kurzweil. We're going to use these tools to make ourselves more expressive, more intelligent, take care of certain kind of jobs we don't have to do. By the 2030s, we'll be putting nanobuts in our body to take care of diseases. That, that wouldn't be so bad, you know? But there's, you know, also, I think he's the guy who also wants to download his brain into a computer. I don't know, that's kind of creepy to me. <laughs> so he can live forever. I don't know. I don't know about that. Now, I mentioned early on, almost at the end here, I mentioned early on that there was a Defense Science Board study on autonomy in 2015. Uh, it's got a releasable report out there right now. Um, that was a real, real uh, learning experience for me. Uh, when they asked me to be a co-chair, it was a group of about 10 people that were going to look at this, and then somehow it got popular, and we ended up with a committee of 70 people. Hard to do something in a committee of 70 people, isn't it, you know? But we came up with some good stuff, uh, ways to accelerate the adoption of autonomy, way to kind of help pull autonomy into systems, how to, how to help with this, and uh, I think you can download that from the Defense Science Board site. So here's the summary. Okay, well, autonomy and AI are really coming, and they're coming very fast. Maybe faster than our policy people are ready for, maybe faster than our legal systems are ready for, maybe faster than we can think of some of the ethical implications of this. What are we gonna do when all the people who make their living driving taxis don't have jobs? What are we gonna do when all the people who deliver services like postal services and stuff 
don't have jobs. Will those people be able to be retrained into other areas or not? I know Pittsburgh is a city that was built on steel. And in the 1960s and 70s, all that steel moved offshore. And there was tremendous unemployment because steel builders, kind of like auto builders in Detroit, could have pretty good blue collar jobs and make a nice living for them and their family ex until they couldn't, until the jobs were gone. Sometimes people are hard to retrain. When you're a 55 year old steel worker, maybe you can't become an IT guy real easily, right? So how are we gonna prepare society for these kind of missions that are coming, these kind of disaggregations that are gonna happen? So, solid system engineering. This community is gonna be so important to this. And whether you're one of the sages who's worked in this for 40 or 50 years, you've got your contributions to make to this, please give this some thought. Whether you're one of the new people, two or three years into this with all kinds of bright ideas, you're gonna have a tremendous role in shaping how we bring autonomy on and trying to make sure we do it in a way that serves us, that doesn't get rid of us. We think some new tools will have to be developed, some new concepts and strategies, especially, for example, in the whole area of um, validation and verification, in the areas of dynamic functional allocation. We know that the transitions, the acceptability of these systems, whether we're ready to accept self-driving cars or other things like that, will depend on how well we start to trust these systems and think that they're safe. This will be complicated by a lot of non-deterministic algorithms that are in there, so they don't act the same every time. Complicated by systems that continue to learn, so that they may not act the same today as they did yesterday and complicated by the fact that almost all these machines will be used in human machine teams. I'm excited about this though. I think this is a great opportunity for all the engineers of the world to work on. And solid system engineering will determine if these systems are helpful systems like C-3PO, remember him in, uh, in Star Wars, or Johnny Five, he was in a movie called Short Circuit. What we don't want to happen is we don't want these systems to become the Borg. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take a few questions. Thank you.